Welcome back to the panel discussion, Exfiltration and Government, Designing an Insider Threat Program, sponsored by Newix on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your moderator, Jason Miller. Our guests today are Andy Castor, the Deputy Associate Deputy Director for the FBI, Keith Lowry, the Senior Vice President for Business Threat Intelligence and Analysis Team at Newix, and Patty Larson, the Co-Director of the National Insider Threat Task Force. Before break, we talked a little bit about the, the idea of po processes and policies. We talked about, is it a technology problem, an education problem? Patty, I thought you left us with a really interesting uh, and, and common idea that this is never a technology problem, not never, but many times not a technology problem. Many times it's a, it's a people and process problem, which gets us to the, okay, well then how, how do you make sure it's not a compliance or a checklist issue? Let me start with Keith on this one. Is this also a problem in the private sector where, where there's companies who are just saying, yeah, we did it, we did it, we're good, and then something happens? And It, it is both. Uh, and for my agency experience, it's the same thing, that a lot of people will take a look at this and say, this is merely, okay, I've done it, I've got my A, B, C boxes all checked, and then I take my book and I put it up on the shelf and I'm good for a year. Uh, but that compliance uh, fails to recognize that the threat is dynamic. And the minute you set your compliance checklist completion uh, on the shelf, one second later, you are now obsolete. Uh, so we teach both agency and corporate clients that it is a process. It's a program. And you have to have the entire program operating on a consistent basis and use the compliance checklist to see if, in fact, I have the most up-to-date things that are available. And as Patty said, when she gives her, her briefings and the education and the seminars that people attend to make sure that they have the most current, up-to-date information, but the process itself cannot be considered a compliance. It has to be an ongoing program. We've heard very similar discussions around cybersecurity over the years with the Federal Information Security Management Act, FISMA, where it's not just a matter of, okay, did you do X, Y, and Z, or did you not? How do you make this a dynamic program, though? Is it a matter of that every day having that person in charge, the executive advocacy, as you mentioned earlier, to say, what are we doing on this latest threat or whatever to, to, to ensure that it's not just it's forgotten about until the next incident. That is precisely the success that comes within organizations, whether they be government or uh, commercial, it doesn't matter. It's that ability of that individual, uh, that senior designated official, to be able to cross whatever boundary it takes to be able to ferret out and stop or recognize and stop that uh, threat wherever it is. Because uh, individuals who come into whatever organization to uh, be a threat they don't care about what boundaries it is. So they're not caring about civil liberties or privacy or uh, security. Uh, and if you have not set up that organization and granted the authority, then every time somebody tries to get that piece of information, they'll be blocked by the stovepipe internally. Patty, from your perspective, as you guys in the Insider Threat Task Force are working with agencies, how do you encourage them nicely not to make this just another compliance exercise? Because it's you know, unfortunately, it's another unfunded, unfunded mandate. Unfortunately, it's another thing that that CIOs and security officers and, and deputy secretaries have to do. How do you get out of that mindset? So there's uh, 26 minimum standards that every department and agency has to meet. Those are the ones that the president signed out in 2012. So you're right. It could very easily devolve into a, yes, I've done those 26, I'm good exercise. Um, one of the things that the task force was called out to do was independent assessments. So the assessments are to verify how agencies are doing against those 26 minimum standards. But we go in with a staff assistance visit mindset more than a compliance inspection mindset. We're not the IG. We actually are here to help. And we help them build uh, programs that really work in their own environment. The important thing that we try to leave them with is it's not just about doing these magical set of 26 things. It's about building a culture in your organization where this is just routine business, that everybody understands that the Insider Threat Program is just part of the fabric of the organization. So that's the first mention of culture in, in our discussion. I know we've talked about people before. Andy, from your perspective, is the FBI building that culture? I mean, you guys already have a very strong culture to keep information secret, but this Insider Threat's a different tact on it a little bit. Um, well, first of all, I, what Patty and Keith said are right on point. In terms of culture, I mean, when you mentioned protecting information and keeping it secret, I think that's part of the insider threat program. Uh, I think uh, one of the reasons we do that is, uh, as I said before, 
I think the taxpayer and the citizen and the U.S. privacy laws, we keep it secret because we don't want to just put things out there or if it's if we kept it haphazardly and the potential for you know mistakes or release of information whether again it was wittingly or unwittingly could cause damage to our reputation and brand uh, the America the taxpayer expects a certain amount of things from the FBI one of that is protection of information and doing our jobs and you know putting bad people in jail so I think that's one of the key factors agencies are on a timetable they have to get outside, not just to, to say we've did it, but show they've done it. Uh, when, going back to my initial opening statement, talking about full operating capability by December of 2016, what's the next year look like from your perspective in the threat task force? So we're working very hard to identify those agencies that have specific things that are keeping them from reaching FOC, full operating capability. Um, and as I said, in many cases, it's not a technical issue. So we're doing things like having forums that bring communities together about legal issues or privacy issues. Whatever those big impediments are, try to address those in a collective manner so agencies can overcome that hurdle and then move forward. Uh, in some cases, it's simply getting leadership engagement. So I've done a lot of leadership one-on-one -on -one visits trying to encourage them that this is an important program. It isn't just an unfunded mandate, but it's something that can help your organization. You would think that with all the incidents, unfortunately, that's happened, it would, you would not have to have those one-on-ones without obviously calling anyone out. But do you get a sense that people understand it, but it just, it's getting buried because there's so many other priorities? And part of you know, your role and, and, and your organization's role is to remind them why this is so important. I mean, everyone talks about don't, don't get on the front page of, of the, we'll say, federal news radio for this one. <laughs> exactly. Now, agencies understand that this is an imperative, but you're right. Some, some of them don't have the strong national security culture. They say, my job is to worry about environmental protection. My job is to worry about education or housing, other things that aren't specifically in the intelligence com community or defense community. So for them, it's sometimes a harder sell to say, but what you have is very important. And an insider can cause just as much damage to all of us if they were in your organization. So it really is trying to tailor the message to them in a way that they understand. And I think that's key, that it's the tailoring of the message. Andy, from your perspective, just to build off what, what Patty was saying, how do you make sure you don't go too far and stop that secure information sharing that is important? Well, I mean, uh, one of our goals is sharing information. It's important that you share information. But, you know, we have legal restrictions. So that's why it's imperative that we always have our, our privacy attorneys with us at all times. Uh, obviously, if there's threat to, to life, our, our property out there uh, it's we, uh, we always notify you know we always uh, disclose first uh, so I think that's it's, it's all about what we disclose how we disclose it while it, while ensuring that we protect the privacy of individuals Keith let me turn to you because the next year for not just agencies but also for contractors there's a lot of complications coming up talk about what you see happening and, and there's a there's a it may not affect Newick so much but it's going to affect maybe some of your partners in terms of having to be uh, cleared contractors mm -hmm. so cleared contractors are going to be required especially in the Department of Defense world um, based on uh, the 13580 the executive order and uh, the establishment of uh, other documents within the Department of Defense anybody who does work and provides material or programs or processes to the Department of Defense is going to have to have their own insider threat program uh, and that is going to be a huge hurdle because as last time I counted there was an estimated 60,000 uh, clear defense contractors across the United States Patty I turned you on this one that's that's a big lift it is. How's that process working so far? Do you get a sense of, of our vendors either pushing back really hard or are they making some progress? It's similar to the government where some of the larger organizations that have been doing this longer are very comfortable. They have a good solid program, but they're worried about their supply chain. They're worried about their subcontractors and others who may not come from the sort of the beltway culture and understand the importance of the uh, this changes that are coming. So. We're trying to make them realize that not every agency or every organization or every company is going to have a very identical inside a threat program. You've got to tailor it to what your risk is and what your environment is. We've done it on the government side, and I think industry is going to end up doing it on their side as well. How often are you meeting with industry? Is that part of your role as the co-director of the Insider Threat Task Force? We get a lot of questions from industry about how to build a program. And while we are, our scope and our authorities are for the executive branch of the government, we realize that the executive branch is doing business with industry. And so it's in all of our interest to try to help as well. 
Is, is there a security clearance issue? That's a whole, I know, different path we can go down. But Keith, from your perspective, is this something that from a contractor, OK, now I have to get a bunch of people cleared? Or is it really just to make sure I know how I'm protecting the data, the systems, the, the facilities? I think it goes back to what Patty just said, that <clears throat> it's recognizing that each individual co company or uh, organization or agency has a different problem set to deal with. So it, it has to be a tailored program based on what it is they provide. Um, and recognizing those supply chain issues, uh, you have to be able to look at who your suppliers are, do a little bit of time vetting them and educating them as well uh, so that they can comply with whatever regulations are put on them. It's not a matter of one size fits all. It has to be a tailored program because it, truly uh, some of these 60,000 are small uh, little businesses that it, th they won't be able to put a huge program in place such as one like the FBI would have with their critical value data. Let me build off something that Keith said and turn to Andy. Building a tailored program, great piece of advice. You guys, again, at the FBI are, are further ahead than maybe some other agencies. Do you have advice? Do you have some words of wisdom for an agency who's maybe listening going, oh, we really need to get this started because we're behind and, and Patty's uh, uh, red, yellow, green grading is way too red for us? Well, I think what the first thing you have to realize is uh, it's not that hard to start a program. I think it sounds, when people talk insider threat, their eyes roll back in their head. I don't think it's that difficult. There's a lot of great products out there. Uh, Patty has a lot of those great products. And the, the first thing you have to do is get your buy-in from your executives. Your executives have to be on board. If they're not on board, then you're not going to have a robust bus program. Um, I think the other thing is it's also not that hard is most organizations have some form of security program. So really all you have to do is build off that. Uh, you start small and you come up uh, and you benchmark with other agencies and then you move from there. Uh, you, doesn't have to, you don't have to go all in at once. You can start small and build off that. I think that's great advice. Let me turn to Keith. From your perspective, you talked about the advocacy piece. What are some of the other pieces that is important? Uh, we, we feel that the, as we go off and teach agencies and corporations, the, the key things are just basically the same thing, maybe a little bit worded differently. But it's getting that advocacy. It's getting the senior executive level buy-in and then establishing a policy, which then is the authoritative document uh, that's signed by that senior executive that says, not only am I supporting, but I'm advocating and I'm telling everyone to do this. Uh, and the last piece comes back, we've mentioned before, is actually the training part. Uh, and that is to get the entire organization understanding what their roles and responsibilities are and that this isn't just something that you can shuffle off to the IT section or to the security section, but everybody plays a role uh, in protecting their information. Patty, Keith brought up something very interesting, the roles and responsibilities piece. A lot of times people hear insider threat and they just think technology, it's the CIO's perspective, it's the chief information security officer's perspective. Is that some? Is that maybe part of the advice you'd give is, 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 it is again, it's a team sport? Absolutely. And the insider is a person. It's not a computer. So it's very important to understand that despite all the great use of big data that we can make in our programs, that all the, uh, the use of technology and tools and hardware and software, at the end of the day, it is a person. And so some of the most successful programs have really used behavioral science to underpin their program. They've decided that uh, they need to understand what observable things they need to look for. Because people indicate certain things. They, they go down a certain path and there are certain things you can observe. What are those things? How can we help identify those before there's an issue? And I think part of that is almost answering those questions too, not just knowing what questions to ask, but okay, what is a, a sample answer? Do you guys give them those sample answers? Like I think you, you offered if someone's working late, if, if all of a sudden they're moody at work and they've never been moody before, are those some of the things? We tell them that they really should have uh, on-site behavioral science support because they need to understand what's normal for their organization. Uh, it isn't just one specific list, list, list of triggers. But if you look at a certain set of behaviors and you have a counterintelligence person look, look at them, they're going to be preconditioned to think a certain way. A security officer will think a different way. The CIO will think a network problem, whatever, right? But the, the folks that really understand human beings and how they tick are very important to look at all the information and make a really informed recommendation. All right. Well, before I, we're almost out of time before I let you all go, what does success look like? Because it's almost like how do you prove a negative, something didn't happen? Andy, was the FBI, what's your measures of success? I think in this program, metrics and, and measures are very difficult. Um, one of the things that, you know, we look at is awareness uh, and training and awareness. 
and you can measure success by, uh, you know, incidents, uh, um, um, incidents, and that fact. But I think one of the key is is training, and then testing to see whether that training is taking effect. Um, obviously, if people aren't getting it and they're not following, then we're doing something wrong in terms of our awareness and training. Keith. From a corporate standpoint, it's it's a little bit easier simply because if if a company has uh, you know a huge dollar amount of loss, and we can show by implementing a program that that loss uh, is less the year following the program has been implemented, then you can actually count uh, you know the success based on that return on investment. Uh, but it is difficult to prove a negative. I will say though that there's another. Uh, uh, category that we used uh, in programs that we've set up both within the agents within government and uh, and outside and that is once you establish the program how often you're able to catch insiders that are doing things that are untoward or or attempting to do things that are in violation of policy and that also can be an indicator that you can go ahead and, and count all right patty you get the last word the outcome we're striving for isn't to put somebody in jail the outcome is to help somebody so for me, success is exonerating an innocent person through the use of the insider threat program. It's heading off a suicide. It's keeping the workplace be a better place for everyone to work. Because we've invested so much in our workforce, so much in our collection capabilities, we need to be able to protect it. All right. Good, good, good success measures all around. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. You've been listening to the panel discussion, Exfiltration in Government, Designing an Insider Threat Program. Sponsored by Newix on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your moderator, Jason Miller. I'd like to thank our guests today. Andy Castor, the Deputy Associate Director for the FBI. Keith Lowry, the Senior Vice President for Business Threat Intelligence and Analysis Team at Newix. And Patty Larson, the Co-Director of the National Insider Threat Task Force. For more information on this discussion, visit federalnewsradio.com and search Newix. On behalf of Newix, thank you for joining our discussion. We'll have the archive from this session available shortly, and a link will be sent to you to share with your colleagues. Those of you who requested a training certificate will receive an email with download instructions immediately following the webinar. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.